Welcome to another episode of the Your Longevity Blueprint podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Lauren Tessier, who is a practicing naturopathic physician. Her practice, Life After Mold, located in Waterbury, Vermont, services local and international clients suffering from mold-related illness complicated by comorbid conditions such as multiple chemical sensitivity, mast cell activation syndrome, and chronic infections like Lyme and co-infections, Epstein-Barr virus, cytomegalovirus, et cetera. Dr. Tessier, previously CIRS certified in 2016, treats not only biotoxin illness, but also other overlooked forms of mold illness, including allergy, infection colonization, and mycotoxicosis. Dr. Tessier, uh, Dr. Tessier serves clients via in-office medical care or through educational wellness consults. She also provides one-on-one -on -one private training for practitioners looking to improve upon their mold literate clinical skills. Dr. Tessier is the president of the ISEAI or the International Society for Environmental Acquired Illness and has been in service to the nonprofit since 2017 in roles of secretary, vice president, and general board member. ISEAI I'm going to say that wrong. ISEAI is dedicated to helping practitioners learn how to diagnose and treat environmentally acquired illness in their client population. The free booklet, Mold Prevention 101, authored by Dr. Tessier, is available on her website and has been circulated worldwide. Find Life After Mold on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, and Pinterest. So welcome to the show, Dr. Tessier. Oh, thank you so much. It's such an honor <laughs> to be here. Such an honor. Well, as we start many interviews, I always ask the guests their backstory. So what is your backstory? What helped you become such an expert in treating mold illness? Sure. So there's a few different reasons. Um, you know, everything kind of amalgamates together. <laughs> and um, some of it's kind of retrospective understanding of the things that kind of pushed you along the way. But where I really started, um, I was doing primary care here in Waterbury. And I had a, a client, a few clients where they were just having like really resistant cases, the typical things for like fatigue and brain fog weren't working, you know, like B vitamins and B12 mm -hmm. and, and vitamin D. And um, after some discussions, it well, it was kind of brought to light the fact that this person in particular had a um, finished basement office and we had Hurricane Irene in 2000. Um, 11 come through, which caused severe flooding in certain parts of Waterbury. Um, and so that really started, I apologize, we have the train going by. <laughs> That's okay, it makes interviews exciting. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, you know, that that really brought the attention to the fact that, you know, mold could be could be a thing. And of course, the dialogue was, oh, well, we fixed it. Everything's dried out. It's not a problem. But then it was like more and more cases in Waterbury. And then mm -hmm. um, finally kind of found out about um, SIRS and Shoemaker and became certified and mm -hmm. just kind of kept chugging along and learning more and then, you know, expanding beyond that. And then, of course, somewhere sprinkled in there, which I, I really feel happens to most functional medicine practitioners, I had my own experience. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of self-convincing and realization that there could be an issue. And lo and behold, <laughs> there was an issue. And I've actually bumped into two personal living situations um, where I've had some uh, mold and water damage issues. So, um, you know, I, I know firsthand what it feels like. Um, mm -hmm. and I, it's horrible, it's horrible. And so, um, after kind of having that firsthand experience and really understanding it, then there are these little pieces of your personal history that you look back on and you're like, well, wait a minute, you know, um, I had a family member who was a teacher in a public school for years, um, chronic daily migraines every day. And those classrooms were just completely water damaged, flooded yep. with water. Yep. When I, I know you see it a lot, tons. Of it's, people. it is so, it is so sad. I, I do see that. And then you, you know, it, at least in my area that I'm like, okay, when the, when the patient comes in and they see their teacher and they're having symptoms, I, I kind of know which schools have the damage, sadly. And I have some patients who have children at certain schools, they can't even enter because the school is just so moldy, so toxic. It's, and it is, it is so sad. Right, right. Um, and it's just to, to play off that for a minute, you know, whenever I have a teacher, I think teachers, I crunched the numbers at one point, like a gross estimation of teachers make up like 0.01% of the US population. And they make about five to 8% of my patient population. 
if you <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. Way. and then yeah. of course there's like female teachers and women seek health care more and that uh, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, understand yeah. that um but it's it's just wow and then when you think about the fact that in that physical classroom where the teacher might be reacting there's usually anywhere from 20 to 40 kids mm -hmm. and then all of these air systems in most schools are are shared these hvac systems so you know the schools we can put a pin in it and come back to it later but schools are are notorious so um you know and then i i look even deeper into my past and it's like i i lost yeah. a family member to a really severe autoimmune disease mm. um and one of the key things that you know i reflect back with my family on was that they lived in a daylight basement apartment and when we went in there while they were in the hospital yeah. they things out and it was it was moldy i was a teen then and you know there and little you knew yep. it's something yeah and so those those things really just um uh kind of keep moving forward with me and of course you know like that that person was my one of my favorite family members as a kid like just like a, would love hanging out with them and goofing off with them and um you know i think about the just the relationship lost um mm -hmm. with having lost them and if i can help prevent someone from you know developing immune system chaos that leads into severe autoimmunity like you know it's one of the things that really um, keeps me moving forward it's it's a regret it's something that i wish i could go back in time and mm -hmm. um so it's yeah so when i say like it molds a a, a thing that's really i've experienced and it, it is really something and it, but it's not it's not me i just realized it i i don't doubt that so many people out there if not 90 percent of the population have had these events sprinkled in their life but mm -hmm. mold was just never connected to it for them so true i totally agree well, you are the mold expert. So can you give us, it's hard to do this in a you know short podcast, but can you give us the 20,000 foot view of mold, mycotoxin and mold related illness? Sure. So I have people like take a minute, close your eyes and think back to the, the, the Venn diagram or even think of the Olympic rings and how they overlap and picture four rings overlapping, almost like a four petal flower. <clears throat> in each one of those petals, I put a type of mold illness. So one is really common allergy, right? Your yep. dry eyes, runny eyes, runny nose, coughing, sneezing, even kind of like that asthmatic picture. And another line, a little bit um, more rare, but still growing in concern is fungal infection. And because the organism is existing in the body, I lump in there kind of colonization and biofilm. So um, in that particular type of mold illness, it's kind of like, um, I think of it as a horror movie. It's like the call is coming from inside the building, you know? <laughs> um, and then the other two petals, um, I, I think of mycotoxicosis. So the toxic impact of mold. And then that final fourth petal, I think of, uh, SIRS or chronic inflammatory response syndrome. And so because all these overlap, you could have someone have an allergy that could flow into SIRS. You could have someone who has a, uh, a fungal infection or colonization that could secrete toxins. And also you could have an allergic reaction to some of the, uh, uh phosph uh, not phospho, but some of the, um, fungal components that are existing in the body. So um, the reason why I think of them that way is because if I can sit down with someone and understand, oh, they tend to lean a little bit more allergic, you know, these labs would probably be the thing I want to order, or they tend to seem a little bit more toxic, more neurological, nor more hormonal. I'm going to test some of the, the toxic components. And so um, I, I'm not the be all end all when it comes to mold for sure, but these are kind of um, my structure that I've used yeah. to understand this really, really, really big um, picture. And you have people say, well, what about, what about cancer and mold? And I kind of lump that into the inflammation component or into the toxic component. So there's so many different ways that mold, fungi, yeast can interact with the body, but those are kind of my my four touch points when I'm organizing a case in my head. I like that. I like that. That's so true. There is just such overlap. So I, I, I like that analogy. Um, how come mold related illnesses are not more widely accepted? 
Okay. How much time do we have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think that there's there's a lot of reasons there. Um, unfortunately, because there is a limitation in the data, so in the, the scientific research, um, we don't see it taught in educations. We don't really see it offered um, for continuing uh, education for physicians and other practitioners. And so people might be wondering, well, you know, why? Why isn't it in the literature? And um, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think part of it stems from the fact we have these things, um, these rules, these ethical rules that prevent us from intentionally harming someone to get to to acquire information. So um, these like uh, institutional review boards, I can't knowingly expose someone to mycotoxins. But what we can do is we can get people on the back end who have been exposed incidentally and kind of follow them along and collect data. So we're limited on what we can get data wise for a living, breathing person. But by the same right, we have tons of living, breathing animal studies. And a lot of people will go, well, the animal studies are totally different from the human studies. Like that's, that's erroneous logic. And I really invite people to kind of pause and pump the brakes on that because these animals are the same ones that we studied all our chemotherapeutic drugs on that we studied all our, you know, hyper uh, hypertension, high blood pressure drugs on. They're the ones that we learned what the progress and development of cancer looks like, you know? So I just, I tell people you have to be careful with the data because there's a lot we can learn from it, but we also need to honor the fact that just because it's not in the data yet does not mean that there's not a yep. possible correlation there. Yeah. Yep. Good. Good answer. I want to get into some of the labs that you do order since you kind of mentioned that, but first I think we should go over symptoms. We've talked a little bit about mold illness already on the podcast, so this isn't a new to uh, topic for listeners, but can you go over common symptoms that you see in mold illness? And then maybe we can further break that down into symptoms you commonly see in women and in children. Sure, sure. Um, so if I had like hundred dollars on every case that walked in the door for a bet, it would, it would be brain fog, yeah. brain fog and fatigue. And it's bigger than the concept of brain fog. I tell people it's like this, like, um, floaty disconnected, like cottony echo chamber of a headache. Like mm. the, it feels like you're swimming through a, a, a dry fog. Like you can't pull the answers down. You can't find the words. You can't um, find the name of the person. You have to read things 10, 20 times over for a sentence to fit. You can't um, recall the last four numbers of the, the phone number you dialed. There's, there's so many small intricacies to what brain fog actually looks like. So, yeah. you know, if I'm going to be super scientific about the name, I would call it like neurocognitive issues. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I, I tend to see more the the hormonal picture and then kind of the immune system disruption um so you you asked about kids and women too is that mm -hmm. correct yeah yeah so um with little little ones little little peanuts um typically we see <sighs> digestive issues is one of the big ones yeah. and we see the um kind of allergic hypersensitivity kind of picture. Um, I find that kids can also have some of the brain fog and the neurocognitive stuff, but because they're finding their way in their new little body, they don't, they don't have the words and the ways to convey it. So they mm -hmm. might say headache or um, they might be diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, tics, like all of these um, things where if you step back and you really think about how that's presenting, it really correlates very strongly to what we see as the quote unquote brain fog in an adult. So the digestive issues are a huge one. And then after that, it's, you know, even vision issues, headaches, it's not normal for a kid to have a headache. Yeah. If a kid's telling you they have a headache, like <laughs> you need to figure out what's going on there. Um, and as for women, 
um, you know, we, we have our own uh, intricate hormonal system that we're balancing. And what we tend to find depending on um, the age, the mycotoxins they're exposed to and kind of already um, uh, genetics that are in place for how they process these toxins and hormones, you can have a really wide array of what female hormone disruption looks like. Sure. Um, anything menstrual related. I've seen um, early menses, delayed menses, lack of menses, heavy menses, um, spotting, um, breast tenderness is another big one I see often. Um, Infertility, we have to be careful about claims with that, but I have seen some potential infertility connections there for sure. sure. Um, and then, you know, again, we have to think back to the hormones because we do have the capability of shifting your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone levels. So um, even with women, we'll see like changes in libido. We can even see facial hair changes. Um, you know, and I would even start incorporating thyroid into the discussion yeah. for women too. You know, sure. hypothyroid is, a, is an epidemic. It's something like what, 60% of women in the US have a hypothyroid condition. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I see a big connection for women between thyroid autoimmunity and mold exposure. So. Um, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you mentioned that because I, I think for years, you know, functional medicine has emphasized the importance of, and, and is still valid and true of eating an anti-inflammatory diet, right? For autoimmune issues and with Hashimoto's, we focus on that and we want to fix nutritional deficiencies and we, we eventually get to removing toxins. But I think with, you know, Hashimoto's, I think we forget about mold sometimes since I'm glad that you brought that up, that that can be a driver, right? Of the impact on the immune system that, that leads to that. So I'm, yes, thank you for Thank you for yeah. bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, there's there's actually some animal studies that show um, that I, I can't remember which mycotoxin specifically that certain mycotoxins will flip on the gene expression in pigs. Animal study um, will turn on the gene expression for um, Hashimoto's and will turn mm -hmm. on the gene expression for um, type one diabetes. So there's there's something, there's something potentially there. It's yep. something at least to think of and look, look into. Yeah, totally. Um, what other symptoms do you see with mold? So obviously brain fog, fatigue, digestive issues. Um, what about like, do you see a lot of dizziness, vertigo, just disequilibrium kind of, mm -hmm. I um, see that. Yeah. Yeah. I see uh, there's a, this internal vibration thing yes. that you hear from a lot of clients or it's this slight rocking. It's almost like it's almost like their Golgi tendons are trying to figure out what's, <laughs> what's happening. Um, but you see this slight internal rocking, internal vibration sensation, um, even for people who are really exposed. And this is where I start getting nervous about the brain component. People will say um, they feel like they're moving in a bouncy castle kind of feeling. So there's something off with mm -hmm. um, the cerebellum or um and then another one that we'll see a lot um, will be the sensation of missing a step, like as you're coming down the stairs and feeling of missing a step. And similarly, um, this one is where we have to be a little bit more cautious. Sometimes people will develop disorientation um, where, you know, a perfect example is you're driving on the right side of the highway. You know that you're safe. You got your, your colors on their respective side. You you're see the, and you have a split second panic of, Am I on the right side of well, what's been that you bring yourself back into the situation? I'm like, no, I'm okay. I know it's happening. And it can be so small or the disorientation can be really big, but um, I, I see that um, a good amount in folks too. So um, the balance and ataxia for sure is goes hand in hand. Um, let's go to labs for a second, which could, you could do a whole episode on labs, but when patients come in to see you and you are highly suspicious that they do have a mold related illness, let, let's stick on that topic first. And then, then I do want to go to kind of mass cell activation syndrome, but when sure. patients come in with a suspected mold illness, what labs are you privy on ordering? I know there is a difference in opinion. I've had different providers on, you know, some only order blood work, some do urine mycotoxin testing. I think I know how you're going to answer this, but um, what labs are you privy to ordering in these patients? 
Yeah, I think it, dep it depends on what they're showing up as. If they're showing up as someone who's more allergic and kind of histamine, histamine-y, <laughs> um, you know, I, I will lean towards running, you know, your typical allergy related panel, your eosinophil count, your ECPs, your 24 hour urinary histamines, um, and even start kind of towing into the mast cell um, stuff. Uh, I let's might... go there. Yeah, let's go there now. I have to interrupt you because with those labs, do you find a lot of abnormalities or do you feel like patients have to ha be having kind of a flare in order to find abnormal yeah, um, there's there's a whole idea that people, if you're even going to mess around with tryptase, you need to get a baseline and then you need to get a flare and there needs to be a certain amount of percent increase. And I treat presumptively. I mean, yeah, anyone yeah. who's in a flare is not going to want to go to the hospital, get rubbed down with hand sanitizer and alcohol and sit in a chair and be poked. Like, it's just... So usually I dialogue with people and I usually contract with them saying like, do you feel comfortable with presumptive treatment and things like that? Um, so with the, the mast cell stuff, I don't, I don't pursue those workups as much as I pursue presumptive treatment with them. Sure. Let's define for the listeners so we don't lose them. Let's kind of define what mast cell activation syndrome is. And actually in your bio, you also are, I referenced um, multiple chemical sensitivity. So can you, can we go there just for a minute? And then we'll circle back around to the lab. But since we're kind of talking about this flare that we sometimes obtain labs in uh, for like mast cell activation syndrome diagnosis, what is mast cell activation syndrome and, and also multiple chemical sensitivity? Sure. Um, I so people can get a, a grasp of this. I think of mast cell activation syndrome as the, the moat around the disease castle. <clears throat> if you can't get in to treat the disease or attack the castle, whatever, if you can't cross the moat. And so what I find usually is people who like flare really easily or have I mean, the first time you even think about introducing anything into their person field, their supplements, whatever, they have really big responses. It's usually, you know, hey, let's think about what the role of histamine here is. So mast cell activation syndrome is a, um, it's a, a big slew of disease states, actually, but when we're thinking of it from a functional medicine realm, we are kind of just diluting it down to there are these white cells that tend to release a lot of things when they're threatened and histamine is one of them. Um, and if they're functioning right, they're only releasing these things either when they need to send a message or when they're threatened. <clears throat> but when they're kind of in a, um, in a state where they're just on high alert, they will react to even the smallest stuff. So for instance, if you have someone and they have a car in front of them that stops short and they jam on their brakes in a quick panic, they'll get a histamine flush. You know, it's it can be something that that simple and that easy. So um, mast cell activation syndrome, it's people are throwing histamine. That's the best way, but they're just throwing histamine at every single thing, overstatement, at every single thing that's coming into their person. Um, and that can make it really, really hard to try to treat them because there's this impenetrable moat around them that if you don't address it first or drain it or whatever the, the horrible metaphor is here, <laughs> you, you won't be able to get to that core there. Um, and I think with mast cell activation syndrome, we also tend to include like histamine intolerance or histamine overload. Again, it's just that idea of this um, kind of allergic inflammation kicking around in the body that just doesn't let you get work done as far as that's that's my clinical perspective on it. Um, sure. And so, yeah. And then what is multiple chemical sensitivity? Ah, yeah. So <clears throat> multiple chemical sensitivity, I see go hand in hand with mold and it's not typically because mold causes multiple chemical sensitivity. Um, it's because I, your body can only handle so many toxins until it starts to kind of not know how to process them. And when it doesn't know how to process them, it kicks them from the liver back into the bloodstream. So you're almost getting this um, uh, re-exposure, this internal re-exposure that happens. So um, I, 
I think it was William Ray, who was one of the first people to come up with the metaphor of the toxin bucket, right? Where your body has X amount of capacity to deal with toxins on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can kind of approach the top of that toxin bucket and never have an issue, but it might be one or two drops into that toxin bucket that can cause that overflowing. So, um, you know, multiple chemical sensitivity is that reactivity towards everything that I find or toxic reaction towards everything. Sometimes histamine is involved, not, not always in my experience. Um, and um, yeah, it, it can make it really, really difficult because mold produces toxins. If you have someone living in a home for 10 years, a year, however long, they'll start to realize like, I can't walk down the laundry aisle. I can't go into the fertilizer section in Home Depot. I can't be in a, a new car. It's, it's really interesting to see how these VOCs and these chemicals um, just alert the immune system and alert the body to uh, a, um, <clears throat> I don't wanna say fear and panic, but, um, into a alerted state and put them on hypervigilance, which just causes a, another big stress response. So um, those are the two big things that I see go hand in hand uh, with mold exposure. They're really saying that toxins emitted from water damage right from mold could be those drops in the bucket that eventually are, are filling up the, the capacity where the liver just can't handle anymore and then patients end up having sensitivities to everything like they should be able to handle not that i want you to walk through the laundry aisle or whatever <laughs> at target but they should be able to handle that but they can't because their bucket's already full right is that right. kind of what you're saying okay yeah exactly so let's go back to labs so we talked a little bit about labs for looking at mast cell activation syndrome although we know you treat right if you're suspecting it it sounds like you're gonna just treat the patient for it but what about for mycotoxin or mold related illness what are labs that you use there yeah, so again, I'm thinking about the kind of four overlapping circles. So again, if someone has allergy, we might do like a total IgE, we might do um, their CBC to get the eosinophil, the cationic protein, the histamine, and all that kind of stuff. Um, even like zinc, B6, and copper to see what's happening there. If someone is having more of a um, maybe colonization, infection, you know, the, the call is coming from inside the house kind of thing. Um, you know, sometimes imaging becomes involved in that, you know, do we have a sinus infection? Are we going to find fungal balls? That's actually the scientific name for that guys. <laughs> fungal wow. balls in the sinuses on CT and MRI. Um, are we going to find, um, any type of like, uh, fungal colonization in the lungs on x-ray. Um, so sometimes imaging becomes a part of that. Now, if I'm also thinking about how can I identify things that are in the body, you can look at it from two perspectives. You can either chase after chunks of the fungus itself. So you can identify what we call the, anti uh, the antigens in the blood. Um, or you can look for the immune system reaction to the particular yeast or mold in the body. They both have their own limitations for sure, without a doubt. If you're immunosuppressed, you're not gonna have as much of an excited reaction with your antibodies. Um, maybe you're exposed to a mold that they don't have that particular lab test for. Well, that's never mm -hmm. gonna come back positive because you can't test for it. Um, from the antigen perspective, you know, if you have a uh, fungal colonization tucked away in your body and it's kind of really um, local, we might not find those little chunks of mold floating around in the serum and the blood. Um, so they all have their limitations, right? So that's why imaging could come into it. So right off the bat, we talked about the allergy component. We talked about the organism living in the body, the infection, the colonization. Um, and then there's the toxic component. If we were to have a true gold standard for, for toxin mycotoxins, um, it would really be a tissue biopsy of a high fat containing tissue. 
There are studies that show that there are autopsies done um, that show collection of mycotoxins in the brain, the liver, and the kidneys, really high fat organs. Um, <clears throat> so the best that we can do, because I can't go around taking chunks of people's brains, um, the best I can do is to see what's coming out in the urine. <clears throat> And there's two different ways that you can test the urine. You can kind of look for the parent molecule spilling into the urine, or you can look for the metabolites of that parent molecule. Um, depending on how you use these in your practice, they have clinical utility, like you can get information from them, but um, they tell you two different pictures. And that's where a lot of the kind of headbutting comes together in, in the mold world. So um, <clears throat> that's really the, the mycotoxin component in a nutshell, for sure. Sure. I'm making notes because now I want to ask you a couple other questions, <laughs> um, uh, which we I didn't plan on asking you, but I wanted, so let's talk about your mycotoxin testing. So there are I'm with you. I, I do urine mycotoxin testing on patients. I think it's very useful. The, I guess the devil's advocate against that is that some providers who I've even interviewed say, oh, that's only showing, those tests are only showing um, mold toxins from food. And what's your, what's your defense to that? Or how would you respond to that? <laughs> um, you know, so there is a, and there's a few animal studies where um, animals were um, exposed to mycotoxins, transdermal, so through the skin, uh, direct injection into the stomach. So into peritoneal injection, and there's a dialogue about the nitty gritty on that, but um, direct injection into the abdomen and then inhalation. They found between all of those that inhalation, I think compared to transdermal had a 20 times higher systemic absorption. Um, and I think it may have been like, oh, two to 10 maybe compared to the, the gut injection. Um, and I believe they did this in rats and then they did this in um, uh, guinea pigs. Interesting. So yeah. the lungs are a direct, I, I mean, it, you can't, other than doing an IV, you can't get any more direct into the systemic bloodstream than through the lungs. Um, so could there be food exposure for sure? Is that picking up some okra toxin? I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. However, this is why it's so important to control the different variables of exposure. Your variables of exposure are your environment, your food, um, and I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm missing one right now. I apologize. Um, mm -hmm. And well, so those are the two big ones. Yeah. Those are the two big ones. Yeah. Those are the two big ones. And so if someone is not changing their diet, if someone comes into me and they're eating um, mangoes and beef and, you know, rinsed rice, and we have them maintain that diet for two years, even while we're doing the urine mycotoxin testing, we are potentially kind of like canceling that variable out. Um, yes, there's bioaccumulation. I, I honor that. I hear that. But it's this, uh, you know, if I have someone who's coming in and they start off on that beef and, um, and mangoes and rice, and then. And why beef, in, beef and mangoes and rice? Okay. I'm just throwing it out. Okay. There. Okay. And then two months in, they switch to just eating peanut butter sandwiches at every meal it's you're changing the profile of the mycotoxin load of the food. So if someone is maintaining no drastic change versus if they came in and they were eating peanut butter at every meal and they continued to eat peanut butter for two years, I would say, okay, well, your okra toxin's high. It was high from the get-go. You're out of exposure. Your diet hasn't changed. I, I try to tune things in from what I can control from the variables. So yeah. If we're not changing food, but we're still in a space that might be exposed, um, I, I try to, I'm, I'm not conveying this really well. Um, I try to bring those two things together. As, as much as you can control those two major variables, that's how mm -hmm. you can really dial in and see what's happening there. Yeah. Um, so yes, exposure absolutely comes from food without a doubt, but you could argue the same thing. If someone's um, uh, uh, 
food intolerance testing, right, for IgA pops up with um, uh, Saccharomyces and fungi, it's like, well, IgA coats the entire respiratory tract, mouth to anus too, and we know that there is crossover between all different fungi polysaccharides um, between fungal species. So it's kind of like you always have to invite in the possibility of the wild card, you know? Yeah, and yeah. so um, how I work through that with people is I do serial testing. You know, one test, it's a snapshot in time. And if we control our variables as we travel through time and do our serial testing, I use that data set to more inform the case than just, oh, here's one test, you're mold toxic. Well, I can't say that from that test because these things are being metabolized and leaving the body. Mm -hmm. If it's leaving the body, I can't really tell you what's happening in that one test. But if we do it over a series of time, I can say, wow, you know, this started high and then it went higher because more was leaving the body. And as more time passed, it dropped down and left the urine because you've drained the reservoir. So, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a really big lay of the land. And I have found the tool set and the movement through the tool set that seems to really coincide with my cases and how I support them. Um, but other people might have other great tools that they find really helpful. You know, some people might swear by IgM and IgG testing. Like, that's great. That's great. Sure, sure. You mentioned peanut butter. And so I just to, for the listeners, so peanuts are a food that commonly are, you know, are contaminated with mold toxins. Mm -hmm. So we, you may see that via elevated okra toxin on a urine mycotoxin test. Can you for the listeners just briefly go over what are the most moldy foods? Like what, what could, you know, what, what are the, I guess the biggest, um, you know what I'm trying to say? What are the foods you take patients off of when you're trying to control for that food variable and then get them on a low mold diet? Yeah. Um, so again, I'm, I'm not really taking them off the food. I'm yeah. not changing the food because I want that variable constant. Constant. Okay. Constant. We okay. want that constant variable. Um, but if I want someone to like come off of a mold toxin food, because I think it's like irritating the gut or causing mm -hmm. a leaky gut issue, or like, let's frame it from that perspective. Right. Sure. Sure. Um, then anything, if people close their eyes and think about what comes from the ground has to dry out and get stored away somewhere before I eat it, those are going to be the foods. Sure. So it's going to be, uh, grains, legumes, beans, um, Coffee, yeah, because that's beans. Yeah. yeah, so, and um, anything that really, and nuts, you know, anything that has, starts a little damp and then gets stored somewhere dry, that's where a lot of the issues come in. Um, now, theoretically, could improper fermentation cause some issues? Sure. Um, can bioaccumulation happen? Meaning I feed a cow some moldy hay, and then they store it away in their fat. And then I cook up that steak and eat it and have some exposure when I eat that fat. Sure, absolutely. Um, we see that in the dairy industry. We see that, um, so dairy meaning uh, like milk. Um, and we see that even in chicken eggs too, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because if people pump the brakes and think about that, <laughs> that has really big connotations too for the human population. You know, human females produce milk and chickens will uh, concentrate the mycotoxins in the eggs and what are the egg yolks, but you know, the developing placenta. Um, and we see that in the literature, we see uh, vertical transmission between mom and baby through breast milk and through the placenta too. Um, sorry for the, the segue off. <laughs> yeah, no, scary, scary. Yeah, yeah. I'm mm -hmm. glad you brought that up. Um, I want to ask a few more questions here. So staying on the topic of urine mycotoxin testing. So we know that some foods can show up on testing, but I think the majority of what we're seeing is from environmental exposure. Um, mm -hmm. Would you agree on that? I, I, I think so. I think so. Or here's, here's where the other one enters. And this is why it's so important for me to try to control variables with people. The, the third wild card is 
coming from bioaccumulation. So stored in the tissue, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so we, we have to take that into consideration too. Is it inhaled, digested, or is it leaving our subcutaneous fat and getting into our bloodstream because of detox? Because we're doing our good job. So basically for the listeners, what she's saying is the third, this third wild card variable could be that this, the other source of exposure is ourselves. Like mm -hmm. literally we are colonized with these, these toxins or however you want to say it that we need to get rid of. So let's go there then. So I guess I want to next talk about the most important aspects of treatment. So from my standpoint, we have to remove the patient from exposure and we want to bind the toxins, you know, mm -hmm. and get them mm -hmm. out of the body and then treat colonization. But let's, my, I, I guess I want to ask if you agree with that and let's expand on that briefly. I know we're wrapping up the interview here, but I do mm -hmm. want to hit on that just a little bit. So first, like back to treatment, like what are the most important aspects of, of in these cases? Yeah, I mean, avoidance, avoidance of exposure is key. Um, there's no such thing as perfection. Um, so sometimes different is better than perfect. And I really like reminding people that, you know, like you can potentially cover and recover in a place that's um, somewhat better and maybe with a different amount of flora. So you might end up moving from a place that's really highly toxic, has a lot of toxic molds into a place that's a little bit more allergenic molds, um, you know, like cladosporium and oroblast, um, and so avoidance is key. Avoidance is key. And um, because of that, I'm not always going to be everyone's cup of tea, but I also don't like wasting people's time and money in my practice by telling them I can recover them in a situation where I can't. Like, it's just, mm -hmm. it's not fair. Spend your money on what you need to, you know? Um, so that's, that's really the, the first key. The second key would be is there a mast cell activation syndrome? That might be a yes or no. If it's a yes, you treat it and then you work on. If it's a no, then you have to say, well, what's happening with their detox pathways? Are they open? If, well, I, I just assume everyone's are closed <laughs> or everyone's are kind of slow and sluggish. Um, so then I usually work with people um, to do kind of a, a prep so not an actual push on detox, but a prep so that their body can handle it. Um, and then before even uh, touching detox, we're also working on bringing some integrity to the cell membranes, because if that's not there, I, I, people flare really, really hard. And is that um, through like using phospholipids or, or how, what do you use there? I, I use phospholipids. I use phospholipids. They're, they're wonderful. Like phosphatidylcholine for the listeners. So yes. We, yep. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so we've talked about so much here today. <laughs> what were we talking about? Avoidance, we, oh, colonization. Let's get back to colonization for a second. Right. So how do we treat colonization? How do you treat that? In, in patients? So I think my question for you is, you used the phrase colonization a couple of yeah. minutes ago in reference to, to mycotoxins. Are you referring to the actual organism or the mycotoxins? Let's talk about both. Okay. I, I mean, I guess I was, I was getting at, ourselves being another source of these, yes. you know, the, yeah. these toxins, but yes, I mean, yeast can literally, right. we can be a huge source of that. It can just continue to grow and it needs to be mm -hmm. eradicated. So I guess both is the short answer. So I think we, we spoke a little bit about like the body being the reservoir and the pool again, you know, of like doing the phospholipid prep and the, the pre, the pre detox work and support. So, um, I kind of work that foundation, lay that foundation, because no matter what, we need to detox your system and pull this crud out of your system. Oh, yep, and yep. for me, that's kind of, um, that I was just trying to get clear on the, the verbiage being used. Um, for the, the living, breathing little entity in your body, they're in our biofilm, they're in our mouth, they're in our gut, they're in our, uh, your genital area. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. The question becomes, why do they start being a threat? And is it possible for people to have, um, uh, well, I guess the, the dialogue there is we can have ones that are part of our flora that become a threat. And then we can have ones that aren't part of our flora come in and become a threat. So I've seen both happen. And so with, with people, we try to figure out, um, you know, is it reasonable to use an antifungal right now? Mm -hmm. 
what's kind of the risk benefit of it. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to bring the immune system back into balance without touching the antifungals? Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of ins and outs with that. I don't immediately put people on antifungals. I've seen instances where people um, can be put on antifungals in response to a urine mycotoxin test. And um, that makes me nervous. I, I mm -hmm. tend to be really prudent in the way I practice. Yep, yep. Um, but, you know, colonization, when it's properly addressed, can do amazing things. Um, there was someone that I worked with for a period of time that we did a, a nasal spray, a antifungal nasal spray, and this chronic neck pain that ran down into their trap that they had had for years after one day of the antifungal nasal spray. Like, it was gone. Was that's gone. nuts. That's amazing. I know. Yeah. I yeah. Know. So there's antifungals can be amazing, but they, they, I think a lot of folks um, go, oh, antifungal diflucan or antifungal nystatin. And there's a lot of intricacies with antifungals, like nystatin stays where you put it. You're not gonna get a systemic effect. You're only gonna treat the mouth, the gut, or wherever it lands. Um, versus some of the other classes of uh, antifungals, some of them only touch candida, whereas 50 years ago, they used to actually hit some of the other ones, but because they've developed mm -hmm. resistance, Yep. Um, you know, they're, they're not as efficacious. So, um, there's also a limited tool set with our antifungal. So it's the dialogue then starts to become, well, what can we learn from antibiotic resistance and how can we apply that in this situation? So it kind of goes back a little bit to terrain theory and tiptoes the, the line of what can we do to bring the body back in balance? So that way it's yeah. not threatened like this, the same way, like, you're never going to eradicate every teensy tiny little spirochete of Lyme from someone's body, you know, but you can maybe get the load down and then mm -hmm. get their body to tolerate it. So, um, yeah, antifungals and dealing with colonization is it's complex, is it's complex, complex, <laughs> complex. And, you know, there's also the question of, um, do you chase colonization or do you wait and see if a infection develops, you know, like um, where it's a true typical infection. The problem with fungal infections is they don't light up in the same way as, as bacterial infections do. They can be kind of silent and look more, I, I think of it as like a cold infection, um, mm -hmm. not like cold and flu, but like it's not as hot and expansive. Um, and it tends to be a little bit more quieter on, on your blood testing. So yeah, um, I, if I had the answer for, for uh, antifungals, I, I would love to share it, but it's a case by case basis, as mm -hmm. you know, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and that's why I wanted to ask that question because we have worked together on a case, a, a mutual patient who we, we think has the colonization. So I just wanted to bring that up for listeners, especially if they just feel like they're not getting better and lab testing is not improving despite controlling the variables of the diet and the environment that colonization could play a role. So I, I, I wanted to go there for a second, but clearly you are a wealth of information. You're very, very intelligent and this is a complex interview. So if listeners are um, staying tuned here and they feel like they wanna work with you, where can they find you? I know you have a free gift as well. So tell us about your, your practice and, and where you are and where they can find you. Yeah, so my practice is Life After Mold and I'm located in Waterbury, Vermont. Um, I do do uh, what I call butt in the seat medical care with people where they come into the office and I manage them. And I also do educational consults with people where they're managed by their local physician and we kind of um, educate help educate the physician to help them navigate that. Um, and so I, I'm found everywhere online. My website is lifeaftermold.com. And then I also am across pretty much all the, all the big social medias, um, Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, Pinterest, even TikTok, which has been a trip. Very interesting. <laughs> 
Um, and yeah, I, I welcome people to definitely check that out. Uh, YouTube, I have some really great videos talking a little bit more about the interface of multiple chemical sensitivity and mold, how right. to find someone to test your home. Um, and if you head to my website, you can get a hold of my um, freebie e-booklet that's called Mold Prevention 101 that really helps people walk through their home to try to pull out the, the, the red flags of possibilities of thing that could be an issue in the future or currently an issue and how to keep your eye on it. Um, and yeah, I've gotten a lot of a lot of good feedback about that that freebie. So definitely head over to the website. Um, there should be something that you could pop up and fill out in there. So awesome. Thank you so much. So last but not least, uh, tell us your top longevity tip. Ah, well, top longevity trip. Um, NAC and sleep. <laughs> NAC and sleep without a doubt. Yeah. Are you literally saying the supplement NAC and sleep? NAC. Or what? Oh, okay. Yep, <laughs> NAC, NAC, yeah, NAC, NACL cysteine and sleep. Um, my, my little one had a sleep regression back in August and I had been a late, a, a night owl. And I started going to bed with him at 8.30 every night. And now I'm up at 5 a.m. well rested. <laughs> and this is someone who would sleep till like 11 if I could. So um, getting enough sleep and being able to just factor that in, even if it's something that doesn't seem right or fit right. Um, if you can make it work, it's so amazing to wake mm -hmm. up early and engage yourself and go for a walk and and have that space. So um, enough sleep and NAC. NAC, I... Your favorite supplement, apparently. <laughs> it's my favorite supplement. I, I once get chewed out at a lecture for using the phrase, I love NAC. I was very unprofessional. Okay. <laughs> You're loud. <Right>. You're loud. Yeah. <laughs> I like it too. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show today and really sharing with us deeper details on mold illness and getting into mast cell activation syndrome and multiple chemical sensitivity. And really thank you for donating your career to helping those with environmental, uh, environmentally acquired illnesses. So you're a blessing. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. Have a great one, everybody.